My son lost control. The neighborhood were in fear of what he might do to me. A victim doesn't want to be a victim. It's nearly destroyed me at a time of life when I should be concerned about retirement. I am on Social Security, and that's it, my income. And he took it all. Well, I didn't report it. You don't brag about being weak. Elder abuse is a hidden problem. We have victims who are truly isolated in every way. And law enforcement officers and those of us that are in people's home have the ability to break that silence, have an ability to broach that isolation and to reach out to those victims sometimes for the first time. Elder abuse is mistreatment of older adults. It can take many forms. Um, it can take the form of financial abuse, physical abuse, sexual assault. It can be neglect. 70 to 90 percent of the perpetrators of elder abuse are family members, loved ones, or caregivers. It's someone who's very important to this older victim. It's very important for law enforcement to be trained in recognizing and investigating elder abuse because it is probably the most complicated type of law enforcement that I've ever run into. It takes putting the picture together. It takes working with a variety of disciplines to see if it makes sense. But what we can't do is just always attribute it to, well, they're old, so they fall. Well, they're old, so they have a broken bone. That's a very dangerous uh, assumption to make. In elder abuse, you have to know how to deal with sexual assault how to look at bruises and wounds, how to do in financial uh, investigations. And you have to know how to deal with the dynamic that we so often see in elder abuse, where it's a family or an emotional relationship that's the suspect and the victim share. They're being victimized, and they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, and they don't know what to do or where to turn. So it's important to address that quickly, which is, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you stay independent. We just want to, to make sure that your safety is being protected. As first responders, we're going to talk about what you guys need to look for when we go out on calls of elder abuse. First thing you want to do when you get out to home, obviously, is make sure it's a safe situation. It's extremely important that first responders are educated and trained in responding to elder abuse. It's important because our first responders are our eyes and they're our ears. Find out if there's concern. Very often, if law enforcement gets called to a home, it's going to be for something other than elder abuse. I guess the best illustration is if, um, if it's a domestic violence um, call that you're going on, and the parties that are involved in this are in their 30s or 40s, and then mom's living in the house, or they're living in mom's house, pays to somewhat see how mom's doing. About it. Is everybody OK? Yeah, everybody's fine. What do you think? OK, how many else? Is there anybody else in the house right now? No. Most law enforcement officers have had very, very little training in what to look for in elder abuse cases. So the signs are simple. But one of the things I find out is how mobile are they? Can they get up and go to the bathroom? If not, well, then where's the walker? It should be right beside the bed so they can use it whenever they need to do that. Do they have access to a phone? Oftentimes, in elder abuse cases, you'll find that the caregiver is trying to emotionally isolate our victim and telling them that other people don't care. And the victim feels like nobody else cares yeah, but this person who's actually abusing me. We can use our senses. So if you smell a foul odor, there's a chance that there could be an open wound on that person or perhaps gangrene set in on, on an extremity. So use your sense of smell. If they have bruises on their arms and legs, there's a chance that those are normal bruising. But when you see bruises on the face, the torso area, or the thigh area, that's abnormal. How many people are living in the home? I mean, if you notice that grandson, granddaughter, daughter, or son living there, there's a possibility that there might be some financial abuse going on if they don't seem to have a, a, a means to provide for themselves. 
Another special consideration for police officers is to always look at medications. Medicines can be used in a variety of ways related to abuse of older adults. People can be over-medicated to make them very confused so that they start signing checks over. Under-medication is also a form of abuse. I won't give you your pain medicine unless you sign this. If things don't look right, if things are a mess, if it looks like medicine is not being administered properly, those things are red flags that law enforcement as a patrol officer should look for. Abuse that occurs in long-term care facilities or licensed facilities does require, I think, a, a little bit of a, of a different approach, or perhaps what I should say is just a different understanding. One of the, I think, difficulties in investigating possible abuse or neglect is you have a lot of people to choose from in terms of possible perpetrators. And then can you really identify one person? Or does it really have to do with the whole system? Patients uh, can be afraid to report abuse because if they report it, somebody is going to find out, and then there's a possibility that, that they will suffer more abuse at the hands of a staff member or caretaker. The best indicator of whether or not a, a resident of a long-term facility is being abused or neglected is that oversight that the families um, provide by just monitoring the situation. Is usually not only the best reporting mechanism, but it's also the best preventive medicine as well. I always meet with the family to get their perspective on how things were going in the facility, how they were being treated, because it's their chance to voice their issues, concerns regarding their loved ones. Sometimes abuse is really perpetrated by one particular person. But sometimes the residents aren't receiving proper care, not just due to one person, but really more of a facility-wide issue. The medical director isn't on top of things, or even the company who owns them isn't supplying them with sufficient resources to take care of them. But it may be that a responding police officer is the first person to have gone in there and noticed that there's a problem. It's important that we protect them because it's a sad thing to think that we allow an elder person to die in poor conditions, in poverty, in the middle of filth, because we didn't open our eyes and recognize that elder abuse is a problem. Oh my, I guess. I've interviewed women in their 80s and 90s who have just said to me, I can't believe my own grandson has done this to me. And then to think about putting them in jail and there's so many excuses and there's so much love. They don't want to speak out against the person that's caring for them. If I report this abuse that's taking place at the hands of my friend or my grandchild, who's going to take care of me after that? I'm willing to deal with this so I don't have to be placed into a convalescent home or a board and care facility. We need to help the victims understand some of the dynamics so that they have the strength to make the report. When first responders get out to a scene, the most important thing as always is to make sure that the elder is safe. Then what I want them to do is document extremely well everything that they have seen. If there are signs of neglect in that home, take a report. Document any type of injuries on that elderly person. Go out, take forensic personnel out, or your own camera, document the stages of the wounds. Another thing that's extremely important when one's interviewing an elderly person to document that person's state of mind at the time of the incident. By recording the contacts with, uh, with victims, whether uh, even if the subject hasn't even been ascertained to be a victim at that point, it captures their emotional state uh, and can objectively uh, reproduce it. It's very important to understand how to deal with very complicated individuals that sometimes we have to deal with. And that's doing interviews of people who may have cognitive deficits. And yes, you can get a good interview if you have the right expertise behind you. I have a few questions about um, your health and welfare. Asking simple questions instead of a long, complicated question that requires a lot of cognitive ability to follow. You might just want to say something like, has anybody hurt you? Even though the person might seem like they're lacking some uh, mental capacity, 
it doesn't mean they can't be a good witness in a case. And, and I think that's really important for officers to, to be mindful of. We just want to double check, you know, make sure that you're okay. There are a variety of important interviewing techniques to be aware of whenever you're working with an older adult. It's important to remove an elderly person from the same location as the caretaker because of, of that sense of fear that they might have of the caretaker or the fear of reprisal. Try to make the conversation as informal as possible, but I'll, all the while trying to obtain information about the housing circumstances if there's uh, issues of medical care. It's important to be aware if that older adult has a best time of day. Some people with certain illnesses do much better in the morning than in the afternoon or vice versa. If an older adult wears glasses, you want to make sure that they're wearing them. If they wear dentures, you want to make sure that they're wearing them as well. And hearing aids, of course, are another important issue. If they have a better ear, you'd like to know it so that you're sitting on the side of the good ear. If I see them, do you want me to have them come over and see you? But speaking loudly, clearly, slowly, and also so that they can see your mouth can make a remarkable difference for people with hearing loss. We're going to do everything we can to keep you safe. Take your time. That's the biggest thing. An elderly person might not respond immediately. They might take their time listening. Don't get discouraged because we need to be tenacious in this field in order to bring about change for our elders. When I started working in elder abuse, I soon began to discover that while I'm trying to figure out what's going on in a case that's involving an elderly person, that there were social workers doing a parallel investigation at the same time. I called the head of Adult Protective Services and said, can we have coffee? And we began to have conversations. We can work together as a team. We have five new cases today. So we'll go ahead and... and we developed the elder abuse forensic center. Thank you. I went to the autopsy, and it is very apparent that this is criminal negligence, but it's not a homicide um, from their strict definition. The forensic center is a phenomenal resource for us. There are geriatricians that I can call out and ask them to come out and do the mental or uh, physical evaluation of a victim. The public guardian can assist us with matters of possible conservatorship. We have the ombudsman, adult protective services. We work collaboratively and it helps us be more effective. Maybe one agency knows something as opposed to the other, and that way we can say, how are we going to rectify the problem? Well, yes, uh, you know, they died of multiple organ failure, but the major contributing factor was neglect or malnutrition or dehydration. We try to make our meetings move pretty quickly. They're very focused on problem solving. One of the huge benefits is all the informal interactions. We've come to know each other, trust each other, respect each other's positions. We all know that we're going to be there on every Tuesday afternoon. Um, and that we're available to each other in between. Because we do come from different disciplines, sometimes we're reluctant to work together. For example, law enforcement, you know, everybody thinks that, okay, we're, our only thing is we're going to go out there and we're going to hook and book and we're going to put them in jail. Well, absolutely. But I can't do this alone. Be real honest, I want to know how other people can help me do a good job in less time. And that's what a multiple disciplinary team is all about. Even if I can't resolve our citizens' problem that first day, I can bring the matter to someone who will be able to make a correct determination on how the criminal behavior can be addressed and what levels of assistance can be furnished to the victim. My advice to somebody who wants to work with elder abuse and the multiple disciplinary team, start with whatever you have. Begin to work together, and as you gain momentum, It'll take on a life of its own. Don't be afraid to be creative. Don't be afraid to color outside the lines. We will help a generation who is perhaps the greatest generation in history who, to live the last years of their life in a better lifestyle because we were able to help them.